Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for having me here. Um, I am not well schooled in the teachings of Krishnamurti, so I am not going to try to frame what I'm going to be talking about in in the terms that he would use, but I hope that I can add some some detail, some insight to how a scientific worldview, uh, specifically with regard to understanding of, um, let's see, I'm going to be talking about evolution of complex sociality, specifically in other organisms, evolution of sex, and how ma how we as mammals and as primates and as humans have come to be uh, what we are. So I, I also, I would encourage questions, uh, but I reserve the right to, to stop them if it's getting to be too much and I feel like we're not going to get through what I want to get through. And I would start by saying also that I've been hearing, I've been engaged in and overhearing such wonderful conversations here around in particular the place that we're in, the nature that we're in. And this is uh, one, of, one of the things that drew me here, that as a, really as a tropical biologist and as an animal behaviorist who has spent a lot of time in the Amazon, in uh, the forests of Panama and cloud forests, and also in northern temperate forests, uh, that I know for sure that spending time in nature is one of the surest, maybe not the most direct route, but the surest routes to a deep understanding of, of who we are and what we can become. So with that, let me see. Good. Um, as the products of evolution, which is my fundamental assumption, uh, I will try to make as few assumptions as possible here, which is again in line with the scientific worldview. As the products of evolution, we um, are not very interesting in terms of what our genes have in store for us. They just want us to make more of them. So, the more we understand about how it is that as humans, the myriad complex ways that that has, uh, that, are, that those things have come to be, the more likely we are to be able to take what we like and discard what we don't like. Uh, because of course, as the products of evolution, we are both beautiful and glorious and rather reprehensible. Um, I, was, I was saying last night uh, that the, um, the fact of maternal love and romance is a result of evolution, as is genocide and rape. And to say that we are evolutionary is not to say that all of those things are good. Uh, that would be making what we call in biology the naturalistic fallacy. What is is not what ought to be. Uh, but so by understanding what is, what evolution has handed us, we can better decide what to pick and what to elevate and what to, what to discard. So selection, uh, which Patik yesterday was framing as natural selection, I'm calling it just selection um, because it includes both natural and sexual selection, which is mostly the, the framing of this talk, is, uh, is extremely powerful. I have argued elsewhere that it is in fact perhaps the most powerful force in the universe. It applies not just to those things that are alive, uh, but imagine pebbles on a beach and watch as the tide moves them over time and sorts them, selects them into size classes with no, with no design, with no goal, and yet those pebbles are being selected by size on, on a tide line. So selection, selection happens everywhere, not just, in, uh, just, not just in evolved beings. Were you just stretching? Do you have a question? Okay. Um, so selection, as Patik said yesterday, cannot look into the future, but it creates processes that can. And that is, is beautiful and powerful. And so here we have um, blue-footed boobies uh, in, off the coast of Ecuador, an island called Isla de la Plata, so named because they do indeed have, it's not totally clear here, but bright blue feet. And most people would look at that and say, well, obviously the blue feet are the result of evolution, but what about the fact that these birds are pair bonded and they spend great effort in, in finding mates, in courting, in deciding who to mate with, in bonding with one another, and in creating and raising children. 
Those are also the products of evolution, no less so than the blue feet and the fact that males and females look a little bit different, but to, our, to an untrained human eye, they don't look that different, which is relatively true in all the species that have, that have pair bonds. So I'm going to move now. I mentioned I'm going to talk sort of about three, three broad things. Those organisms, a, a, a scattershot view of organisms in which there is social complexity, just to, just to showcase the fact that humans are by far not the only ones who have social complexity. Then I'll talk a little bit about the evolution of sex and why there are two sexes, and then uh, talk about what we are as mammals and primates and such. So uh, across a somewhat broad swath of organisms, we have complex sociality in which there is uh, there is knowledge of other individuals, there, is, uh, there, there are friendships, there are alliances, there, is, um, there, there, are, there are frankly deep emotion and it, it doesn't take long in the field with many organisms to know that this is true. So the things that are true of organisms that tend to be deeply and complexly social, like we are, and of course, we, we have these things much more so than, than most other organisms do. Uh, they tend to be group living, of course. Group living would be obviously a precursor to being social, to engaging with one another. They also tend to be long lived. The longer life you have, the more likely you are to have the time to learn who your, who your compatriots are and to develop relationships with them. They tend to, be, they tend to have generational overlap which means that uh, across the species uh, for which this is true, uh, and I'll solicit from, from you after I talk through this list what you think that might, who those, who those species might be, uh, you have not just parents and children living in the same social group, but generally grandparents as well, and sometimes depending um, as many as four generations at a time. So there is, there is teaching and learning and cultural exchange between generations. Uh, and, and finally, um, Organisms, species that have complex sociality almost always have long childhoods. And I'll talk a little bit more later about why that's, why specifically that is so, so relevant. Um, but broadly speaking, the longer your childhood, the more helpless you are when you are born, the more necessary the, the relationship with parents is and the relationship with then peers and the more necessary learning and culture are to becoming who you are. So when a, when a human baby is born, there is a way in which it's human, but there is very much a way in which it is not yet fully human until many, many years later. And you know, people have argued at length about when that moment might happen. But really, as with so many truths, the categories can be real around, you know, so what is childhood and what is adulthood, while the borders between them aren't that clear. All right, so the borders can be fuzzy, even though childhood and adulthood are real things. So given Given this list of what tends to create sociality in a, in a complex way in organisms, being, so, uh, being group living, being long lived, having generational overlap, having long childhoods, do any species besides the wolves on the screen uh, come to mind? Can you, can you think of any that... The elephant? Elephants. Perfect, yes. Elephants. Any others? Monkeys. Pretty much all monkeys. Um, some more than others. Um, the larger the social group, the more the more complex they are. So baboons, they're kind of nasty, but they're they're very social. Um, but yes, all monkeys. Um, dolphins. Say again. Lions. Lions. Good. <coughs> Lions. <coughs> Unique among the cats, really. Oh. Turtles. Turtles. Not so much. Um, turtles are fascinating, and they're behaviorally um, they're behaviorally remarkable, uh, but they don't, they, they mostly are not in social groups, they, they aggregate. And so the distinction between like, do you ever come together in a group for nesting reasons in the case of many sea turtles or for mating reasons in the case of, for instance, many shorebirds, uh, you, can, you can aggregate without necessarily having long-term relationships in which you recognize individuals and when you come back together, you keep track of what you've done together before and sort of, you know, who's, who's done what for whom and, and whether or not you're owed a gift or you're, it's time for you to gift. So turtles don't tend to play that game, um, <clears throat> whereas dolphins and 
if I say dolphins already, dolphins, elephants, lions, monkeys. Um, and then also there are several clades of birds uh, that do this, parrots, uh, the corvids, which is crows and jays <coughs> and ravens. Ravens are a little different because they're somewhat solitary, but they, but they do keep track of identity. Uh, and so this, this question of what it is to be an individual, what it is to be uh, someone with someone, whether or not you're a person or a crow or a lion, with a personality that is then recognized by others in your group is, is what we're getting at here with regard to what makes you um, socially complex. <coughs> so um, we're not alone. And here are just, I, I, we've just generated a, a good list. It's not a complete list, but a very good list of some organisms that, that are socially complex. Yeah. Ah, so ants, ants are a fascinating example. Um, in fact, the whole, the larger clade of ants, bees, and wasps, um, it, some, some in that group, clade just being a sort of technical term for a, a unique piece of history, um, are, are solitary, but most of them are social, and they tend to be, we don't have time here, but they tend to be what we call in biology eusocial, EU, meaning true or good, which is you know, an unfortunately uh, connotation laden term. Uh, but individual ants don't manage to accomplish much. And so they do not, individual ants, in fact, the language that is used is they have castes. They have types of behaviors that they engage in, but individual ants within a caste don't differ one from another, so far as we can tell. Whereas the superorganism that is a hive or a colony can accomplish great things, but they aren't, they they are more like an individual is the colony, as opposed to this group that has come together for three days and will separate afterwards. We are all individuals, while we also have at the moment a shared social group. Um, and all of us are individual, even though we've all come together for similar reasons here, which is, which is somewhat, which is different. We have both less shared fate than an ant colony and more individual difference. Uh, but that's a, it's a great example, and there are, there are some interesting both genetic and environmental reasons for why the ants, bees, and wasps are like that, which we can talk about later if you're interested. So um, elephants uh, exhibit, like many other of uh, these socially complex organisms, exhibit grief. When one of theirs dies, they mourn, they, um, they behave differently, they stay with the body for a while, and they... Um, and they, they, they just grieve. And for, really it was Jane Goodall in the 60s who first, <coughs> whose, whose observations of chimps, which were resisted at the time, allowed us to start using this language that we had reserved for humans until then. And once, once you start really carefully doing the observations in the field, and observation doesn't have to be visual, the observations through any of the senses you can use, the, the seeing, the hearing, the smelling, tasting not so much when you're talking about elephants, um, but you know, the, the experience of what it is to be these organisms, we, we, we see for sure that there is common personality, that there is shared emotion, that there is shared complex sociality. So grief in, in elephants and others. Uh, these are spinner dolphins, but the entire clade of dolphins have, um, have, have complicated social structure in their groups, and they are able, so in the case of spinner dolphins, one of the things that they do when they're hunting is they communicate to each other through a kind of language, whether or not we should be calling it language or not is debated, um, but it, it appears to have syntax. So a kind of language they're communicating to one another where to go within a group as they circle around fish, and then pairs of dolphins go in at a time and hunt fish for 15 seconds or so, and then come out of the group, and then they communicate who's next as the rest of the group circles around them. This takes remarkable rapid fire communication, the likes of which we imagine you couldn't really do without language. And so it looks, it looks like they are, uh, they are doing something that, that feels very much like the kinds of things that we do in, say, um, a, a game, a sport. These are Caledonian crows, uh, but the whole clade is remarkable. They are, a particular study of these 
these, the species, the Caledonian crows in the South Pacific, found that they actually spend more time with friends, with unrelated individuals than they do with family. And the structure of the relationship looks more like sort of social groups, um, social friend groups, than it does like what we imagine um, where they're just hanging out with kin. So, and this, I mean, this picture I love because it really looks like the, the guy on, on the left is just telling it how it is, explaining things. And we, we, don't, we don't have evidence at the moment that crows are conveying complex, that they, you know, we, we don't know that they have syntax, for instance, but, um, but they are clearly getting together to exchange information. And the nature of the information we're not sure of, but they are clearly exchanging information. And uh, finally, this is, this is baboon, so one of these, one of these monkeys uh, that has complex sociality. In many monkey species and, uh, and some of these other species that we've been talking about, there was clearly theory of mind. Uh, theory of mind, I, I gather that you talked a bit about this at the conference last year. Um, theory of mind refers to the ability to infer the mental state of another being. Right? So baboons, like chimps, uh, like, like gorillas, I believe, uh, can clearly can understand that an individual who uh, has, has done something, who has something, uh, is in a different state of mind than if they didn't do that thing or they didn't have it. So um, in, this, in this particular picture, um, this, let's see, this, yeah, this baboon, this is a mother, this is a mature mother, this is a young mother with her baby, and the mature mother is coming up to the young mother, basically asking to hold the baby, and the young mother doesn't really want to share, um, because in part, young, first-time baboon mothers sometimes have their babies stolen and, and destroyed, because like I said, baboons aren't very nice. Um, but this, this baboon mother over here is looking, and um, I, I am a, asserting this by looking at this picture, but this is based on uh, decades of work, actually a, a fabulous book called Baboon Metaphysics uh, by primatologists uh, Cheney and Seyfarth, uh, who look at the evidence for theory of mind in baboons and find, find ample evidence for it. So we are, we are not alone in having individual differences and being in, in caring deeply about what happens to those we love and keeping track of those whom we love, in mourning when they're gone, in considering what they have in their minds and knowing that it might be different from what's in ours. Okay, so um, change, of, change of scene now. We'll come back to the concept of complex sociality at the end. We are all related. As, as we heard tell yesterday. We are also all distinct. This, this graphic came out 10 years ago. It's, it's beautiful. It's impossible to interpret at a first glance or from this distance. Um, but it purports to describe the entire evolution of life on this planet, starting, um, starting here and then going out in both directions. So it's a, it's a strange kind of axis, which often the most beautiful visuals are. Um, but one of the things that is important to getting a, a deep and subtle understanding of evolution is to say all of this life exists or did exist. There are some extinct forms on this, on this graphic, but not many. We are not all of them. You know, we are not shellfish, right? But we are a number of things that we think we're not because we are parts of history uh, that, uh, that have been around from the beginning. So we were first single-celled organisms without nuclei, and then where eukaryotes, where eukaryotes it actually goes like this. At the, at the biggest level, we are, we are life, and we are eukaryotes, which is a slightly smaller group, and we are animals, okay? And, and I'm skipping lots of groups, of course, but we're animals, and we're vertebrates as well. We are also, and this never sits right with people the first time they hear it, but we're also fish. We're also fish because we were fish, and the fact that we no longer look like the kind of fish that we think of when we say fish doesn't mean that we're not fish, but it's just a, it's a kind of group membership. It's about history. It's not about judgment, right? So we are life, and we're animals, and we're vertebrates, and we're fish. We're also tetrapods, tetrapods four-footed. Uh, so we, as fish, came out of the sea and came onto land. Snakes are also tetrapods. So 
in, in thinking that, you can see, okay, the, the language around what we call ourselves doesn't mean as much as what the group membership is. So if four-footed organisms, tetrapods, include snakes, then you know that there's something real about the history, while the language that we use to describe it may not be as meaningful. So we're life, we're animals, we are uh, vertebrates, we're fish, we're tetrapods, we're mammals and primates and monkeys and apes and hominins and humans, and many other things in between, but we're, we're all of those. And so uh, we've inherited truth from, from all of that. You know, from, from our animal ancestors, there are things that, um, that are true of us uh, that have not changed, um, but then there are also things that are true of many animals that are not true of us. So we are all, we are all related, we are also all distinct, and our history is a long one, but it is also um, while our history is not changeable, our future is. And that is what, um, that is what a, a deep understanding of evolution, I think, can, can, can give us. That once we know where we've come from and what we are, we can affect what we are going forward. So on this, on this you see that about, actually you can't see, it's completely fuzzy, um, about four billion years ago-ish, three and a half, four billion, I'm not sure where the current estimate is, life evolved on Earth. About 1.2 billion years ago, sex evolved in eukaryotes, in cells with, uh, with nuclear genomes. And with a few very rare exceptions, it stuck. Once sex evolved, it stuck. Whereas there's a lot of other traits, even you know, coming onto land uh, seemed like this great innovation in tetrapods, but there have been a lot of returns to the sea. Think of dolphins, think of seals, think of otters, think of sea snakes. There are a lot of returns to the sea. So being on land was pretty great, but it wasn't so great that it didn't reverse sometimes. Whereas sex, with a very few exceptions that are fairly imperfect, has basically stuck. So that begs a question, why? Like what, why, why is there sex? Why do we have it? What's, what's the point? So 1.2 billion years ago, it shows up and it's mostly in our lineage anyway. It's been there ever since. And first, let's think about what the costs are. Like, why wouldn't you have sex? Well, the costs include the fact that when you reproduce sexually, you lose 50% of your genome with each reproductive event. And this seems trivial to those not accustomed to thinking in the sort of economic cost-benefit terms of evolution, of evolution, but it's huge. If, if all, of your gene, all that your genes want from you is to reproduce themselves as much as possible, that so-called two-fold cost of sex is huge. So there's got to be a really big advantage to having sex if you're going to s suffer the cost of only, only passing on half of your genes every time you reproduce. Other kinds of costs are if you were successful in the environment you were in and now you're sexually reproducing and mixing up your genome with half of another individual's genome, there's a good chance it's gonna fail. So there's a, there's a risk cost. And then there's just all of the time and resource cost involved in finding a mate, in being available to a mate at the right time, in creating offspring, in if this is the kind of organism you are, in taking care of the offspring, either together or, or alone. That is, for anyone who is engaged in mating and dating and reproduction, uh, which I would say is probably everyone in the room, a, it is often a joy, but it is also a huge time commitment. And if you could actually assess the sort of metabolic resources involved uh, to, try to try to quantify it, which is probably impossible to quantify it perfectly in humans, it's also a huge metabolic cost. So all of these things point that, that are the costs of sex point to, wow, why did it happen? And given that it did happen, it was so costly, why did it stick? Because the fact of it sticking and really being the case in just about every life form on the planet at this point suggests that there must be a huge upside. And <clears throat> indeed there is. <clears throat> Excuse me, so this is, um, this is cloud forest in Ecuador. And you see just the, the wild, amazing diversity and variation of life forms. Mostly what you can probably see in this picture is, is plants. But there are maybe close to 100 species of plants in this picture alone. And in an in a environment that has that much diversity and that has that much uh, therefore change, 
it is really hard to be as fit for the environment 10 years from now as you are now. And so in any environment that changes, any environment that is variable, be it a cloud forest or a city, being able to sexually reproduce and thus create offspring that are different and therefore perhaps a better fit for their environment is a good bet. And we have evidence um, now both from lab and, and field that this is in fact um, a, a real advantage of, of sex and there are molecular mechanisms by which uh, we see that mixing up um, existing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> genomes is, is adaptive. Um, but the non-technical explanation is basically when environments shift, and environments always shift, sex is an adaptive approach. So that explains sex. So um, the, the answer, of course, could go on for years, as you know. Uh, but the short version is generalists aren't as good at anything. And uh, it is, it, you are more able to do what you need to do in a shifting environment if you have general capabilities. In the case of Patek's question, you have a, if you have an ability to withstand a wide temperature range. Or if you have an ability to both walk and run and climb and, and swim. In our case, we can do all of those things. But are we the best at any of them? Are we the fastest? No. Are we the best climbers? No. Are we the best swimmers? No. We are remarkable generalists, humans are. Individually, we tend to specialize. But as a species, we are probably the most generalist species on the planet. But that comes at the cost, and I'll put cost in air quotes there, of requiring our social group in order to be, to be whole effectively. And so if you, if just to take the, the more simple example, the physiological example of why can't you simply deal well with all extremes such that when the glaciation comes, you can now deal with it and your, and your offspring can deal with it just as well, even though they're experiencing something that no one in your lineage has experienced for 12,000 years, say. That, that would mean that when the glaciation wasn't there, you who had in you the ability to deal with very cold temperatures were not dealing as well with the temperatures that you were living in when they weren't extreme, and so you would be outcompeted as a result. So specialists persist, and, uh, and when extreme events happen or just when shifting environments happen, the shift that, the shift that happens is not responsive to, to you, but you are responsive to it. You, the organism, is responsive to it. And as much as possible, individuals respond. Individuals adapt, um, put broadly, but we acclimate. But more to the point, what we do is we create offspring that have a slightly different set of tolerances and skills than we do. So that, that is a pretty good brief explanation of why there's sex, but it doesn't address actually why there are two sexes. So that, and, then, and for many people that will never have occurred to them as a question, but there are a few very, very unusual organisms out there that actually have multiple mating types. And, um, and two is the rule. Two is the most common on this planet and would probably, will probably be the most common on any other planet on which life has evolved for, for good reasons. Uh, but it's not, it's not necessarily that obvious. And so the idea is when, when you have sexual reproduction, you're not just putting half of a nuclear genome from this organism together with half of a nuclear genome from this organism. You also have to have the machinery of the cell, the cytoplasm of the cell, the mitochondria and the ribosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum and all of the organelles of the cell in order to make a cell function. And so you can't just put uh, DNA and DNA together and boom, life is created. You also need all of the structure around the cell. 
And so if you were to create a bunch of different kinds of, of gametes, like sperm and egg, but say that there were 12 kinds, and all of them had a little bit of cellular machinery, but not a lot, when two of them got together, they would probably argue, not literally, but they would probably disagree about whose cellular machinery to use. And so having one gamete type that has all the cellular machinery and one that doesn't have any of it um, basically gets rid of those disagreements. And then it also allows the one gamete type, the ovum, which has all the cellular machinery, to sit still because it's heavy now. It's big and heavy. It's laden with all the cellular machinery and to be found by the gamete type that has nothing, basically, but a motor and a tail and, and nuclear DNA. So sperm, or in plants, pollen, um, is tiny and has basically nothing but half of a genome, and it finds stuff. It finds eggs. That's what it does. And uh, if you, when you have intermediate types, they both tend to argue about who gets the cellular machinery, and they don't tend to be able to find each other, because once you have a bunch of the cellular machinery in it, you're, you're heavier, you're more sluggish, you can't move around as much, and finding the egg is actually the, the primary mission of the sperm. So I have a quote here from um, a wonderful book from the 80s that I'm going to read to you as I put up on the screen. A sperm is an entity with a mission. Search, find, fertilize. In intense competition with other sperms of similar ambitions, it has become stripped down and streamlined. As a participant in a race, it has jettisoned all non-essential baggage. The prize for which the sperms compete is a relatively enormous gamete, the ovum, whose immobility is due to the bulky cytoplasmic mass that accompanies her share of the chromosomes. Although each parent contributes almost equally to the nuclear chromosomes of the new creature they create, not all contributions are equitable. Here, at the very fundament of sexuality, is love's labor divided, and it is the female who contributes the most. So I walk us through this in part to then lay the groundwork for, for talking about sex roles, what it means to be, so we, you know, we've somewhat arbitrarily decided the thing with the egg is called female, always and everywhere in nature, and the thing with the sperm or the pollen, the thing with the, the, the type with the tiny gametes that have no cytoplasm associated with them we call male, and the type with the large gametes that don't tend to move we call female, and that is true across all 1.2 billion years of life history on this earth <clears throat> where sex has evolved. And what follows from... I cannot. I apologize. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I'll go after no, no, no. It, yeah, unfortunately, no. Yes. Is that just scale, or is the egg, in fact, many, many, many times much larger than the sperm? This, this is not, I, I don't take micrographs, so this is a micrograph that I found online, but um, I cannot attest, it, it looks real to me. This, uh, this, this may well be the case. I, I don't know. So I'm going to ask you a question. Female or male? Which is better? <laughs> it's not rhetorical yet. I, I invite you to... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why? Okay, so the female contributes more to the zygote. She contributes her mitochondria, which does have some DNA in it, and she contributes a bunch of the other, um, you know, all the other organelles. But the contribution to the zygote doesn't necessarily make you better, I would say. So every, every answer, I'll just warn you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, but, there, but there are lots of, there are many possible answers here, I think all of which I can probably push back on effectively, but I'd love to hear other ones. <laughs> well, which, uh, so, so you jumped right to it. It's not. It's a terrible question, actually. It's a completely terrible question. Um, but it's one that most humans actually walk around imagining, oh, I know, I'd, I'd rather be, or this strategy is better, or oh boy, isn't it easier to be A? 
right? And we all have different narratives in our heads about which one it's better to be. And when I've, when I've asked that question with, uh, with college students, often I have people identifying the, the gender that they are as the thing that is better. And maybe it's important to believe that you are the thing that is what you'd rather be. But the fact is, that there's, no, there's no better. Um, and you know, one, one game that we can play here is imagining, just from, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, how many children has the most successful man ever produced? orders of magnitude more than the most successful woman has ever produced because uh, this initial inequity in contribution to the zygote between, not the ducks, but um, between the egg and the sperm is, um, is then magnified. Once that difference exists, you get a magnification of, inve of greater investment by females, greater choosiness by females, greater investment typically in, in young when there's any parental care, maternal care happens before biparental care. Uh, in, in most species. And <clears throat> so that, that limits, you know, in, in humans, the extremely long gestation and lactation time just limits how many kids a woman can have. But imagining, therefore, that you'd like to be, you know, Genghis Khan <laughs> um, forgets the vast majority of males in that situation didn't, didn't, get, didn't reproduce at all, right? So on average, from just, a, just from a strictly evolutionary perspective of how many offspring did you leave later on, on average, males and females obviously leave exactly the same number because we are sexually reproducing, obligate sexually reproducing organisms in which every single one of us has the same number of male and female um, ancestors, um, with a few little exceptions. Um, so. It's not, it's not better to be male, it's not better to be female. We are equivalent in terms of our strategies, um, in terms of the value of our strategies, but the strategies themselves are quite different. And so we have sex and gender roles, and usually when we're talking about non-humans, we just call them sex roles. And just humans have created a new word for, uh, for, for what we call in other organisms the behavioral things that accompany being a particular sex. So a relatively recent piece of research uh, that looked at fossil tail feathers in oviraptors suggests that oviraptors, which are, which are extinct dinosaurs, uh, I say extinct because birds are technically dinosaurs, so we still live among dinosaurs, uh, but oviraptors as dinosaur-like dinosaurs, uh, we imagine now from reconstruction of fossils that the males had elaborate tail feathers that they shook in a dance for the females in courting them. And we can all imagine lots of other sex roles in which males are displaying actively to females. Most of the bird song we're hearing is male. There are, there are some exceptions for sure, but most of the, most of the song is display. Moose on antlers, the dewlap on many tropical lizards, uh, the plumage on many birds, and the closer you get to a mating system in which you have pair bonding, in which you have male and female engaged in uh, a relationship that is one-to-one, -one, what we call monogamy, the less distinct the male and female strategies tend to be, and the less clearly the males tend to be displaying and the females tend to be choosing among the males displaying, but the sex roles themselves are, are, are stable and they, they persist throughout. So as by way of example, again, to, to veer away from humans, I wanna just give a few examples of sex and sex role, role switching in fish. The vast majority of, this is now <coughs> fishy fish, <coughs> ray fin fish, specifically reef fish, the vast majority of fish have, um, are just one sex throughout their life. But some fish switch. They're what are called sequential hermaphrodites. They're born one sex and they switch to another, and they switch to another under particular, behavior, under particular environmental conditions. And as soon as they switch, their behavior switches too. So flame wrasses uh, are protogenous, meaning first female, so they're born female. And they live in, fem in groups that are mostly female with one male, and the male basically is reproducing with all the females. But what happens when the male dies? the largest female turns into a male and becomes the male in the group. How does it switch? What does it mean to switch? 
they, they literally start producing, instead of eggs, they produce sperm now, and there are, there are a number of these cases, so I'm not going to remember all of the particular behavioral modifications, but they begin adopting... What causes that? I mean, how does that there are, we, know, we know some of the answer to that. We don't know all of it. The, the mechanisms of the switching are, um, are still a little bit unclear, but it's, it's hormonal, it's chemical, um, and... It is, it is prompted, presumably, by some of the very, you know, the same hormones that Atik was talking about earlier. And, um, you know, both, both the so-called, the steroid hormones, the androgens like testosterone and the estrogens, but also dopamine and, and vasopressin and oxytocin and such. So that also happens randomly and then some lead to survival and some die? Well, this is, it's not random. So that's, it's, it, this is not random and this is within the life of a single individual. So in that, really the, the plasticity involved in uh, behavior, but the very precise way in which it happens and the ability to predict the environmental conditions under which sex is switched is part of, you know, really maybe the main point of what I'm trying to get at here, that the switching itself is not random. It is produced by a change in the environment, which is that suddenly, all these females are surrounded by no male and they have no ability to reproduce. It is that absence of a male, and no, we don't know exactly what, you know, how it is that they're, how it is that they're perceiving it, what exactly the perception, you know, feels like, looks like, smells like, tastes like to them, uh, but under those conditions, and this has been observed both in the field and, uh, and in the lab, under those conditions, take a male out of the scene and the largest female turns into a male. I think it's the largest female. Um, I'm actually not sure, it might be the smallest female. Um, the most dominant female turns into a male and, and the group persists and no other females do, it's just one. So similarly, in, who are these? Humbug damselfish, reef fish have wonderful names. Um, in humbug damselfish, which are also usually protogenous, they have the same kind of sex switching mechanism. But in the case where a male has, where a female has become a male, but then all of the females on his little bit of reef have disappeared, he switches back into being a female. And then he goes off and finds another group. So they can switch back again. So it's exactly, it's not random, but it is prompted by environmental circumstances, the plasticity, and there's, you know, there's great plasticity, not just in sex role switching, but in terms of how, how you mature, how you grow up across all manner of organisms. And we as, as mammals, we're actually more, we're less plastic phenotypically, anatomically, and physiologically than many fish are, than many lizards are, and frogs are. Uh, but what we, we are more plastic in is socially. Perhaps you could explain the term plastic. Yeah. Maybe not some people may not know. Sure, thank you. Um, so plastic in this case just refers to, a, a, mutability is the wrong term, an ability to change throughout life. Exactly. Yeah, an ability to change throughout life. So it's, it's a technical term that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, plastic. <laughs> plastic. That, um, that seems to be a very rare uh, exception, such that across, what's the population of the planet now? Seven billion, something like that. Across seven billion people, there have been a couple instances of males being able to lactate, which is indeed hormonally induced. I think prolactin gets produced, something. Um, but the, the rarity of the event means that it is almost certainly not adaptive. That, you know, basically in order, in order for us to point to something and say, that's an adaptation, it needs to be complex and persistent over time and variable in extent. Uh, and one other thing that I'm forgetting at the moment. Uh, and the fact of it being extremely rare and apparently really new uh, suggests that this is not necessarily adaptive. However, there is a mammal in which males lactate. It is a species of bat. I'm just curious, when you say about 
certainly to the, the rarity. Well, there's, so there's, there's probably three different questions in there. Um, we have no evidence from the archaeological, the historical, the cultural record that males have ever breastfed. Um, or, well, there is, though, I, I have some, but I'll OK, we, we can look at it. I've, I've spent some time thinking about this. And it's, it's not something that in cultures that, that we've, we've talked about, um, that, that we've looked at, that we see happening with any kind of prevalence. Is hormonal birth control changing things? Yes for sure, 100%. It is new, it is so new that we can't tell yet all the ways that it is changing things, but it is both incredibly freeing and uh, it is messing with ancient systems in a very important way. Uh, so that, maybe I'll, I'll stop there for now and we can continue this uh, later. So we have fish, reef fish that are born female and switch to male if they end up dominant in the hierarchy such that they can switch to male, we have some reef fish that can switch back again, depending. And then there are also some reef fish that are simultaneous hermaphrodites, in which they have both the male and the female reproductive parts at the same time, but within an individual mating bout. So what that, that makes something easier. It makes finding a mate easier because suddenly, instead of looking for 50% of your species to mate with, you can, you can look for 100%, and then you can make a choice between any one that you find. Within a mating bout, though, in the case of, who is this, indigo hamlets, uh, one individual always plays the male role, and one individual always plays the female role. And male and female roles, which are obviously indicated by the gametes, by are you producing sperm at the moment or are you producing eggs, is also indicated by things like vocalization, by color, they shift color depending on what role they're playing, and other behavioral indications. And so they, those two individuals may come back together within the next day, indeed, and play different roles and produce different gametes, produce the opposite gametes. But when they do that, they are also switching up all of the behavior and the other aspects of the roles that they're playing, the vocalizations and the color and, and the behavior. And just one more example of what it, um, how important sexuality and sex roles have become in vertebrates. There are a couple of species of vertebrates that have become asexual. And whiptail lizards is one of them. Is several of them. Um, so this is this is an image from 1987 in which on the left you have a species of whiptail lizards that have sexual reproduction, and that's a male and a female engaging in mating. And on the right you have an asexual species in which every member of the species is female, but females still engage in what's called pseudocopulation. And if they don't, they will not produce eggs even though they receive no sperm and they produce their eggs entirely without the inclusion of any, any other DNA from any other individual, they still need to engage in the courtship and the mating act in order to produce the eggs. So this, this I just share as an example of how important, uh, how important sex roles and the behaviors around sexual reproduction are, even in the case where the sex itself is lost. It does um, with an important caveat. Every now and again, uh, female in the all-female species, in the asexual species, individuals at the edge, and by every now and again, I mean we've seen it in the 40, 50 years that it's been studied, so um, pr pretty commonly in evolutionary time, uh, a female will actually reproduce with a male from a neighboring species, neighboring both uh, geographically and phylogenetically. And, the, and by so doing, actually brings in a little bit more variation, genetic variation of the population. Uh, but it, it is a, is a one-time event such that her children now look different from all the, other, all the other members of her population. And in fact, she's speciated by doing that. Uh, but they do seem to be persisting um, as well as anyone's persisting in this world right now. Yeah. It's a, it's a clade, it's a genus called Nemodophorus, which has many, many species in it. And so some of the species are bisexual, are sexually reproducing, and some of the species are asexual. And so on the left here, um, I didn't put the names in just because it's 
Latin. Um, but on the left is one of the sexual species, and on the right is one of the asexual species. And they look to an untrained eye very similar. On the snakes, that Say again? Snakes. Are there any asexually reproducing snakes? Um, so, our, so I think that all snakes have two sexes. Um, I don't think that there are any asexually reproducing snakes. I can't think of any at the moment. So, um, so what does this mean, like, without even having our sex involved, the behavioral roles persist? So what does that sort of imply? Uh, so imagine, it's, again, it's a little hard to see here, but um, that courtship and lizards looks like approach and, um, and, uh, and, and mounting and uh, wrapping the tail around and the female who is about to ovulate but will not ovulate without this happening plays the female role even though it is another female who has approached her and courted her and mounted her and wrapped her tail around the female who is, who is actually going to ovulate. So behaviorally, there's a whole suite of, of events that happen that need to happen in order for ovulation to happen. But it's not, it's not a male doing it, and there's no exchange of genetic material. It's just the behaviors that are, that are required, uh, which, which itself just, again, points to, um, you know, Darwin, Darwin had great insight in saying that selection, natural, uh, evolution by natural selection, was extraordinarily powerful, and he had no idea what the mechanism was. And when DNA was discovered in the 1950s, the, the world that cared about these sorts of things immediately went, ah, we have our mechanism. But that has caused problems, actually, in our understanding of what is actually going on evolutionarily, because genes, genetics, DNA, is a important mechanism of Darwinian evolution, but it's not the only one. So we have also epigenetic phenomenon, by which you know, some of these mechanisms we know, they are chemical, by which uh, expression of genes are affected by neighboring genes, by environmental conditions. We have behavioral phenomena, we have symbolic phenomena. All of these things are also mechanisms of Darwinian evolution. And largely in, in science and in, sort of in, in the world, people imagine that if it's not genetic, it's not evolution. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm pushing back against here and saying, for instance, here we have a behavior that is necessary in order to ovulate, even though the sexual, the, the original reason for sex, which is combination of genetic material from two individuals, isn't happening in these asexual species. Uh, but the behavior of, of sex roles and sex play is still necessary in order for ovulation to happen. So genetics, Aren't, aren't playing a part in why that is critical now. The behavior has persisted after the genetic reason for the basis for the behaviors has disappeared. So there's, there's obviously there's conflict in terms of male and female will have somewhat different ideas about what they want at different times. And there is also obviously cooperation. Uh, an example that is probably familiar to everyone is that of the group of spiders called the widow spiders, including the black widow, the brown widow, in which uh, there is sexual cannibalism, in which after attracting a male to mate with her, uh, the female eats the male. This is obviously one of the biggest examples, the most obvious examples of conflict between male and female that you might have. Uh, it's called, you know, we call it, um, somewhat speciously, I think, a nuptial gift. Um, in this case, the nuptial gift is the male himself, his body himself. He is giving to the female in order to feed both her and therefore their progeny. It's actually pretty rare in spiders. It gets a lot of play because it's so remarkable, but it's actually a relatively rare situation in spiders. And there are also situations, species, in which it's facultative, in which sometimes the male gets away and the female does just fine. He lives to mate another day. Uh, but in the widow spiders, it seems to be more or less obligate. Uh, so that's an, that's an easy example of conflict, right? At the other extreme, and it's a continuum, it's not binary, right? These categories are real, but the borders are fuzzy and it's a continuum. At the other extreme, we have duetting in Andean songbirds. And the, these, um, these animals pair bond and they sing a duet that is so tuned to the other 
that you cannot, if you're not looking closely at who's singing what, determine that there are two birds singing or, that, or who is singing what song. So I have a, I have an audio file here to play and I can play it a couple of times. The video that's gonna come up, um, it's so beautiful and bright in here that you may not be able to see the colors, um, but it's tagged in traditional colors where when the male is singing, it's blue, and when the female is singing, it's pink on the sonogram. And the female in this, in this species, the female initiates. And so the, the male and the female are actually predicting what their pair bonded mate is gonna do next so as to sing at the right moment. So, you s I don't know if you can see, but it starts, I'm gonna do that one more time. No, there we go. Obviously in this video, they're imprisoned, um, but <laughs> mostly when they're doing this, they're not. Um, and that was, that was for the sake of, of getting it on, on tape. Um, so we have sexual cannibalism at one end of the extreme of evidence of conflict between the sexes and duetting that is so closely aligned. And um, these Andean songbirds are not the only ones who duet. Actually, there are many primate species, several of their gibbons and uh, Indri in Madagascar who, who sing these mournful songs at morning and evening as a way of probably um, talking to each other, but also informing each other of their whereabouts and saying, oh, we're starting the day, we're ending the day, where are you, are you coming back, where are the kids, uh, did you eat, these, are, these sorts of things, the sorts of things that you know, we would often, at this point, text uh, to our partners. And so songbirds, uh, we, we have no idea what they're saying. We can imagine, but we don't know what they're saying. And we can imagine more what the gibbons or the Indri are saying, uh, because we can also do, and, and they have been done, very long field, um, field seasons watching these organisms and figuring out what they do after they sing at each other. All right, yes. Yes. Uh, how is that adapt? Well, it's adapted for reproduction, basically, but one would assume or think that with evolution, it would have evolved in such a way that the male is protected, right? Like, or because self-preservation. So he, because the goals of our genes are so uninteresting and they are only about making more of themselves, if he is successful, if he, if he enhances his chances of making progeny in the next generation by giving up his individual existence in service of that fact, it's a win evolutionarily. That's, in, that's nearly impossible for humans to wrap our minds around because, because we are long lived with generational overlap with long childhoods and, um, and, and we are socially complex. And so our understanding of what we are as individuals is so much more complicated and we can't, yes, I think most of us, probably all of us in here who are parents can imagine making the choice to sacrifice ourselves for one of our children, but that would be an active choice, um, not around sacrificing ourselves for a future, maybe possible child um, with a lady spider who you just met and who feels like eating you. Um, but it's, it, it's adaptive, it works, um, it is so, um, it is so widespread in the species where it's found and persistent evolutionarily uh, that it is clearly adaptive even though to our eyes, to our sensibilities, it looks, it looks like a crazy decision. And yet, like I said, there are some species where it is facultative. And so in those species, the males do benefit from trying to get away and, and if they do, they can go on to mate another day. And, the, and, and in other spiders, they do that, exactly. So the nuptial gift can be like, could you just eat this instead of me? That would be great. <laughs> like, I brought a pizza. <laughs> that's, that's better, it tastes better anyway. So, so, so in, in pretty yeah. mantises, actually, I don't know about the common spiders. Yeah. They said that the, the cannibalism of a female after sex is really no more than her trying to get a nutritious meal. Right. So maybe I'll say the same thing, but I mean, so in that sense, is it a sexual cannibalism or just well, it's, um, sh he wouldn't, 
the prediction is, and this is borne out by what we see in terms of natural variation, the prediction is that he wouldn't put up with it absent. You know, she might, she could predate him. She could be a predator on males and predate him and eat him and, and be satisfied as a result. But he will, he is predicted to fight less and to basically succumb to being eaten after he's mated uh, because his, his kids are now on their way to being in existence. Okay. So mammals, so again, we are, you know, we're, we're life and eukaryotes and animals and vertebrates and tetrapods and mammals, and it's a smaller group, but still close to 5,000 species strong. Mammals have, um, most of us have gestation and live birth. The, the eponymous trait that we are named for is, of course, mammary glands, the ability to lactate. Uh, but there's some, there's some weird mammals at the base of the mammal tree, the echidnas and the duck-billed platypus that uh, don't gestate. Um, and don't actually even have nipples, believe it or not. Um, but, but the rest of us, uh, we, have, we have gestation, we have live birth, and that, hold on, I'm gonna back up for a minute. The initial asymmetry in terms of investment in the zygote, where the egg has invested, the, the female who has invested an egg has put in a lot more in terms of resources than the male who's put in a sperm, leads to this further asymmetry in terms of mammals where females are gestating and lactating. And that then is enhanced with the obligate maternal care associated with pregnancy with lactation then um, means extended developmental periods. In every mammal I can think of, there's some period of time when the mother remains with the children and it's not just about feeding them milk. It's also about teaching and learning and bonding and learning how to be a mammal of whatever species it is. In primates then, we have, so with, with mammals compared to our closest relatives, we have an increasing brain to body size ratio. Primates are even brainier. We have an even bigger, all primates have an even bigger brain to body size ratio than do uh, other mammals and the mammals to which we're close, most closely related. We have even longer gestation, so there's an even longer period of basically cooking the kid inside the mom, and therefore an even longer period of absolutely obligate maternal care. And we tend, primates have smaller litters. There aren't any primates that give birth to eight, 10, 12 kids at a time. And, um, and accompanying that, we have a decrease in the number of nipples that, that primates have. And we have longer childhoods as primates and later sexual development. So the, the later sexual development and the longer childhoods are obviously very much aligned with one another. But what all of that means is there's a long period for all primates where kids are just being kids. They're just learning how to be whatever they were born into. But if they were born into it in one place versus this other place 100 miles away in some different part of the forest, um, if they're, a, say, a lemur, this is actually, that's an injury, and this is a crowned lemur, both in Madagascar, um, they're going to become different kinds of crowned lemurs or injuries than if they were born in a different place, because a lot of what they are as primates is not just their genes, it's also their socialization and, and how they come to be. So um, with regard to smaller litters, the importance of that is that the fewer kids you have, the more likely you are to invest in each of them and to spend time with them and to bond closely with them. And compare that to, um, say, frogs that meet on a spring night when they're all singing in a pond and they extrude sperm and eggs and they both go away and neither of them even meet their kids. Right? That's a case of no parental care all of the reproductive investment, again, to use the language, the economic language of evolution, uh, is in the, the mating um, and in the sort of pre-zygotic, before the zygote is formed. And the more, the closer we get to us as humans, the more of our investment is not just in figuring out who we are going to engage with, but also in, in rearing the children themselves. And this is true, this starts to be true in mammals and in primates, and then, um, a smaller group than primates is the monkeys, uh, which includes both New World, this is a squirrel monkey from Amazon, um, and Old World monkeys, and also includes the apes. Pri monkeys continue the primate trends, um, and there are, of course, lots of other anatomical and physiological changes. We've become more, um, we've become more visual, uh, we've become climier, 
uh, and um, there are just a number of other things that have changed. But with regard to our reproductive truths, monkeys uh, have even smaller litters. We tend to have singletons or twins at the most. Um, you know, modern uh, endocrinological enhancements of reproduction in humans notwithstanding. Uh, and we tend to have individual cycles rather than breeding seasons as monkeys. And the impact of that is that if you have a breeding season and all females are in estrus at the same time, then it's possible for basically males to monopolize the reproductive effort of females. And you're more likely to get um, a polygynous system where there's no paternal care of children and where females are doing all of the maternal care and you don't really have bonding between the sexes at all. Whereas, and this is only one of many things that can predict the evolution of monogamy, which otherwise is very rare in mammals, if you have individual cycles where females are coming into estrus uh, at whatever moment their body is ready for it. At whatever moment the particular environmental conditions are ready, there's been enough food that they are fat enough, there are the right kinds of males around or the right male around, uh, their previous child, if they are not, um, if, if, they've, if they're already a mother, has been weaned or is ready to be weaned. And so at that point, they can come into estrus again. And that's not to say that any of this is conscious or that there can be choice involved, but the individual cycling of of specifically monkeys, and even more so in apes, and even more so in humans, allows for greater, basically, control of reproduction, and therefore, an ability for males and females to come together as, as a combination in which they actually engage with one another. And it's, it leads for the potential for paternal care as well. Oh, and all monkeys, most primates, but all monkeys have a social group. We're all social, and the bigger the social group, uh, the more complex it tends to be, obviously. So humans, these are my two children back 12 years ago or so, um, one of them falling over, as babies tend to do. And the reason I put that picture up is to indicate, um, is to, to remind anyone who, for whom it's been a while since they've been around babies, or if you haven't ever been around babies, they are completely helpless. Right? They can do absolutely nothing for themselves at all for a very, very, very long time. And that's a feature. It doesn't seem like a feature when you're dealing with it uh, when they're tiny, um, because uh, they really just do need you to be with them all the time. And the more time you are with them, the more time you are actively touching them, uh, the, the stronger and more resilient they'll be when they grow up. They are, they are so helpless uh, that, I mean, effectively, uh, we, we should be gestating them for longer. They're not really ready when they come out, uh, but the anatomy of, of the pelvis is such that in order to get the huge brain that humans have uh, into a baby, you need to have it born earlier than it, than it should be, leaving it really completely helpless for something like the, eight, the first eight or nine months of its life, at which point babies begin to be able to do a few things for themselves, but still it's a very long time before they can be left safely on their own. So this is, um, this was taken by a former student of mine. Actually, this is an Osprey parent. And neither he nor I, the student who took the picture, know which parent it is, because Ospreys uh, are pair bonded. And in any species which is pair bonded, it can be difficult uh, for those who aren't expert in thinking about the species to know if you're looking at a male or a female. They tend to look alike. Uh, so this is an osprey parent, maybe a male, maybe a female, with his two chicks, or with her two chicks. And they also, ospreys, like humans, humans more than ospreys, of course, uh, have a very long childhood, and bonding in individuals is, uh, is, is critical. Um, it, is, it is necessary to give the child a sense of the security that they can then take the risk to go out and explore and learn how to be an osprey. In the case of an osprey, they need to be really ready the first time they leap out of that nest, otherwise they're going to plummet to the ground. And humans may not have quite as uh, distinct a moment of, of grappling with reality that way, uh, but there are many such moments. So most humans alive today are part of cultures that favor monogamy. Most human cultures that have been in existence throughout time that we can, that we have evidence for in the last hundred years or so, um, have been some kind of monogamy or kind of light polygyny. 
Uh, but most cultures today, most humans today are involved in cultures that do favor monogamy. And that pair bonding, that monogamy allows, as I've said a couple of times, for the joint raising of children. And so this again, this is, this is my family, um, when about, must be 10 years ago or so, um, with you know, my husband and I really co-raised our children. And I know many people who do that now. And it isn't imagined to be what is traditional, but I am arguing that actually it is exactly what we are aligned to do. It is exactly what our, all of our history, from certainly from being mammals and becoming monkeys, becoming primates and monkeys and apes, has led to this ability to pair bond and co-raise children and thus allow both adult members of a pair bond to continue to explore their own unique identities while also having the cooperation of the family group. That that is something that humans are uniquely well placed to, to accommodate. Of course, pair bonds have both cooperation and conflict in them. And how it is that we discover who it is that we want to be with is not at all well understood. We know a few things, right? We know, for instance, that um, the major histocompatibility complex, which is an immunological, it's a, it's a set of proteins that is on the surface of cells uh, that allows your immune system to recognize antigens. Um, that in humans, as in many other species of mammals, we actually prefer individuals that have a different MHC from ours. The idea being that uh, if you have offspring that have parents with two different MHC complexes, they will be better adapted to a broader array of pathogens that will show themselves. So that is, that is one thing that we know. It is hardly fully explanatory of how we come to fall in love with who we fall in love with or are attracted to who we're attracted to, but it is one piece of it. And it turns out that the MHC is, is somewhat smellable that we have, we have an ability to smell distinctions without it being conscious at all of, of differences in MHC between individuals. Um, but that is a very mechanistic, precise, chemical explanation. And there is, there is both bigger and more emergent truth, and we know less about what the mechanisms are. Uh, but we, we definitely know that within any pair bond that, that is successful, there is conflict, that you are never fully and completely aligned with the individual that you are with if you are viewing through your own eyes, which you cannot help but do, uh, but that there is also cooperation which is persistent and lasting and in, in the best relationships, uh, it, it extends far beyond the conflict. And that truth then is true not just for male-female bonds, or male-male bonds, or female-female bonds that are romantic and sexual, but also to, oh, you can't see that at all. It's too bad. Um, this is a campfire um, uh, on a field trip that I had with my students. Um, and, I, and I picked it to showcase the importance of friendship. So just like those Caledonian crows that I mentioned, and we're almost done here. Just like I mentioned, the, the, Cal the Caledonian crows who are focusing on um, spending time with their friends rather than spending time with kin, most of us spend most of our time with people we have chosen to be with, right? And those are critical. Friendships are absolutely critical in all of the kinds of complex social organisms that we started off talking about. Elephants and dolphins and apes and and most monkeys and lions and crows and parrots. The relationships and the keeping the relationships alive are absolutely, absolutely critical. And so finally, I would say that what we, what we know to be true is that there's, there's conflict um, within individuals, between any two individuals, within a group, and then there is cooperation. And what we, what we need to have to try to figure out is how to do an end run around our worst evolutionary instincts that would have us identify who our tribe is and stick with it. And instead recognize that this, this is our tribe, right? That we are, we are on a planet on which we have shared history with every other lineage on this planet. 
be it all the other humans or all the other humans and animals and fungus and plants and prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And we also have shared fate. Uh, bizarre speculations about finding another rock to land on, notwithstanding. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of science fiction, but that's one that I have, I have no interest in pursuing. The idea that we are going to make a good life for ourselves by abandoning this planet and finding a new one is, is not viable, right? We, we, this, is, this is our home, even if we long-term found new places. This is our home. We have shared history here with everyone. We have shared fate here with everyone. And so expanding our sense of tribe, expanding our sense of who is us and who is them. We, always, we will talk always about us and them in conversation, but as much as possible when we're making decisions about, say, policy, for instance, thinking about all of us as having more in common than we do um, that which divides us, I think will be the best way to move forward. So that's what I have. 